pere, 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 Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Crap Cafe. I'm your host, Don Trenton. And today, class, I want you to go ahead and open up your textbooks and flip all the way back to the East Blue Saga of One Piece, one of the few sagas within all of the series that has main antagonists who completely vanish after the events of their arc. A rather clear deviation from most of the more recent antagonists in the series who often continue to loom in the background, only awaiting their time again in the spotlight. And this would certainly be the case for three of the main antagonists of the East Blue Saga, the Fishman Arlong, the Black Cat Captain Kuro, and the Iron Pirate Don Krieg. But is Oda really an author who would so callously throw these characters to the wayside? I, for one, choose not to believe that. So today, I will be doing the legwork of exploring the background of a certain Don and showing exactly how Oda secretly revealed his connection to a certain family, as well as his true goal within the story. But before we can lay down the foundation for this theory, I first want to prove that Oda at least has an interest in expounding on these long-forgotten characters. And thankfully for my case, within the first arc of the New World Saga, Arlong's past and backstory are front and center during the events of Fishman Island. <laughs> As seen in Hachi's cover story, after the events on Kokoyashi Village, Arlong was promptly captured and arrested by the Marines. And while he was absent from the Impel Down breakout, during the events of Fishman Island, we do happen to receive a narrative clone of Arlong in the form of his biggest fan, Odie Jones. It's here that we learn of Arlong's upbringing and are able to gain a whole new perspective on his actions in Nami's hometown of Kokoyashi Village. You see, after being abandoned by his father and left to care for his younger half-sister Charlie, Arlong grew up in the lawless area of Fishman Island, known as the Fishman District, and it's here that not only was he exposed to the cruelty of the pirates who often pass through here on their way into the New World, but also the bigotry and the disgrace discrimination that human beings can truly be capable of. As on the surface, directly above Fishman Island, in the tourist attraction known as Sabaori Archipelago, there exists an active merfolk trafficking operation, in which mermaids and fishmen alike can be bought and sold for a high price. Meaning that Arlong would unfortunately go on to have a lifetime of negative experience with humans. His worst experience of all was the assassination of his longtime hero and captain, Fisher Tiger. And it was only after this life of constant oppression at the hands of humanity that Arlong decided to settle in the East Blue, said to be the weakest of all four seas, in pursuit of, in a way, reenacting his trauma upon the citizens who reside there. By raiding several towns and a series of neighboring islands, Arlong and his crew, using their superior strength and abilities, successfully claimed their own territory in the east. It's there that, as we know, he began to charge the residents of his new territory a fee of 100,000 berries per adult and 50,000 berries per child, and this fee would need to be paid every month in order to prevent the destruction of their island by Arlong's own hands essentially mirroring the practice of the Celestial Dragon's Heavenly Tribute, in which the islands all around the world are forced to make a sizable contribution in order to receive aid from the world government. Aid that comes in the form of protection from pirates by the Navy and their Marines. And finally, Arlong's last act of reenacting his past trauma was the creation of his home, Arlong Park. This was built in honor of the Sabaody Amusement Park, the archipelago's biggest attraction a place that, for the longest time, both he and most fishmen children could only stare at with envy, while the humans who inhabit the island get to enjoy the park to their liking. And with this insight into Arlong's past, we learn that everything he was doing in Kokoyashi Village was only an attempt of gaining control of his past childhood traumas. It completely reinvents his character and explains his otherwise terrible behavior. And incredibly, it's something that we only learn about some 600 chapters after Arlong's last physical appearance in the series. And thankfully for us, kind of proving that Oda doesn't really forget about his past antagonist. If you've seen my recent theory about Captain Kuro and his potential connection to Cypherpole, I won't be really mentioning it, but feel free to either click here or click the link in the description below. 
But in that theory, we discuss the existence of who's who and exactly how his backstory allows us to extrapolate a whole new history for Kuro, one that, like Arlong, completely explains his motivations throughout his arc. So, if Oda has been going out of his way to secretly reward his most eagle-eyed viewers, then what if East Blue's most underhanded pirate? Might he have been given a counterpart in the New World, similar to Hody Jones and Arlong, or Captain Kuro and Who's Who? Or is there potentially a small background detail that might allow us to extrapolate more from his character? So let's take a moment to examine the post-time skip era of the story and see if we can locate any sections where there are some ties to Don Krieg. And while at first it might sound like it's a really daunting task, I was actually able to find it pretty quickly. It might surprise some of you, but the answer is in Dress Rosa. See, not only is this the first time we hear the title of Don since Krieg's departure from the story, with the introduction of Don Chen Zhao, but we also meet a character within his family that looks remarkably similar to Krieg, Chen Zhao's grandson and the 13th leader of the Hapo Navy, Don Sai. But that leaves us with two questions. First, why do Don Chen Zhao, Don Krieg, and the newest of all Dons, Don Sai, all share a title? And secondly, why do Krieg and Sai share such an uncanny resemblance? If you hadn't already noticed, Don Krieg and Sai have the exact same facial structure, and even their natural hair pattern is the same. Yes, while at the time of his introduction, Krieg is sporting a rather sleek fade, when we take a look at his old wanted poster that was briefly shown in the story, we can see a much younger Krieg with longer hair, and while still blue, he's the spitting image of today's Don Sai. But while they look very similar, they are two very different skin tones, so shouldn't any possibility of them being related be ruled out? Well, if you bust open your old science textbooks and go to the section on Punnett squares and genetics, you may realize that darker skin seems to just be a recessive trait within Chen Zhao's family, as both Chen Zhao and Bu have much lighter skin than Sai. In fact, Sai is the only one with darker skin at all. So, does this prove that Krieg could at least possibly be related to the Chen Zhao family and the Hapo Navy? Well, let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. First, we'll need to establish an actual timeline link between Krieg and the members of the Hapo Navy to see if there's any place that he may fit into their history and see if there's a connection between the two that may prove some sort of association. At first, it might be easy to shrug off any potential connections between Krieg and the Hapo Navy, as Krieg is a pirate from the East Blue, and the Hapo Navy is based in the West Blue and operates within the Grand Line. In fact, the West Blue, if you're familiar with the One Piece map, is a trip across both the Red Line and Grand Line away. But while I say Krieg is from the East Blue, I can't say that with any certainty. Our earliest known moment in Krieg's timeline is actually his escape and takeover of a prison ship in the East Blue, meaning his country of origin and early childhood years have never actually been determined which is really all the wiggle room that I need to start theorizing. So, just who are the Hapo Navy, and how might they relate to Don Cree? <laughs> to understand the Hapo Navy, we're first going to need to understand a little bit about the kingdom in which they serve, the kingdom of Kano Kuni. Not to be mistaken with the name of the country in our most recent arc, Wano Kuni, but similar to Wano's resemblance to real-world Japan, Kano is the One Piece equivalent of China. Located in the West Blue and controlled by their ruler, King Ramen. And don't flame me in the comments, that is not a joke, that is his real name, you take that up with Oda. But this world government aligned nation holds a long kept secret. You see, Don Chen Zhao, Bu, and Sai represent the latest generation of the leaders of the Kano Kingdom's navy and secret pirate fleet, the Hapo Navy, with Chen Zhao, the 12th leader of the Hapo Navy, currently serving as its temporary leader while his grandson Sai, the future Don and the 13th leader of the Hapo Navy, continues to grow and develop. While in this probationary period, Sai acts as the first commander of the Navy. And last, but very much least, we have Boo, Sai's much more than disappointing younger brother who has somehow managed to secure a position as the Hapo Navy's second commander. The Hapo in the Hapo Navy, when directly translated to English, means eat treasures representing the purpose of the Hapo Navy itself, the kingdom-sponsored raiding of treasure and goods for the purpose of amassing a massive amount of wealth for the sake of the Kano Kingdom. 
You see, for the previous 13 generations, the Hapo Navy has performed this task diligently, collecting treasure on their various expeditions and storing it in the country's treasure repository, located within the Jewel Ice Sheet, a cavernous area within the ice continent that possesses regenerating ice. This allows the massive fortune to be kept safely out of reach despite its visibility, as only the leader of each generation of the Hapo Navy is capable of splitting the continent using their clan's ultimate technique, the Hashoken, essentially acting as both the strongest warrior and the key to the kingdom's treasure. So going back to our theory, if Krieg was in fact part of the Chinjiao family, as the eldest of the three grandsons, he may have felt some sort of claim over the position of 13th leader and Don. But since we know that Sai was chosen in the end, could his rejection from that position be part of what drove Krieg to leave the Hapo Navy? If Krieg wanted to be the Dawn and gain access to its treasure, yet was denied for being unworthy, that easily could have sent him on the power trip he's been on since his introduction to the story. In fact, there would have even been ample opportunity for this event to occur, as unfortunately for the Kano Kingdom, at the height of the pirate career of its 12th leader, Don Chinjiao, they caught the eye of the legendary marine hero, Monkey D. Gark, and Chen Zhao's mighty drill head was destroyed. After this crippling loss, the Navy needed to select its next leader, someone capable of serving the role that Chen Zhao had held for many years and to continue the tradition of their forefathers. While we don't know exactly how long ago this event took place, it's safe to say it was somewhere within the range of one to two decades ago. But that would mean that, at the time, Sai, who was currently age 28, was chosen to be the next leader of the Hapo Navy when he was only 8 to 18 years of age. And Krieg, for the record, his hypothetical elder brother or relative, would have been around 24 to 34 years old, a prime age for the new leader of a country's armada. So if Sai wouldn't develop into a proper Don for another 10 to 20 years, then why was he chosen to be their leader in the first place? In fact, because Sai was chosen as their future leader so young, the kingdom was left incapable of opening the jewel ice sheet and accessing their stockpile of treasure, sending the country into ruin as they no longer had any access to their endless stockpile of wealth. Ultimately, this loss of both their greatest warrior and key to the kingdom's wealth was too much for the country to handle, and set it on the downturn it's been on for over the last decade, culminating in the state of the country as we see it just before the events of Dressrosa, in which the kingdom is in the middle of a losing war, with a crippled naval commander, and forced to wait on the development of their next leader and their future dawn, Sai. In fact, things were getting so desperate for the kingdom that in order to secure their standing, Sai was set in an arranged marriage to Uholicia, the daughter of Chichilicia, who is the leader of the rival Niho Navy. But if being married off to your rival isn't bad enough, at the time of their proposed political union, Uholicia already had 25 other husbands, which you kind of just have to respect. And additionally, while the Hapo Navy is in Dressrosa under the pretenses of securing the Marimara no Mi and bolstering the strength of their country, their true goal is actually to investigate the country of Dressrosa and locate Doflamingo's weapon manufacturing and distribution network. By disrupting this network, Kano Kuni hopes to cease the flow of weapons to their enemies and turn the tides of the war, pulling themselves up by their bootstraps while they wait for Sai to master the Hashoken technique. Luckily, however, for the country, a few good punches from Luffy was enough to recave Chen Zhao's head in and return his horn as well as the key to the country's funds. However, this horn would only last for so long, as while protecting Baby Five, Sai's future wife from an attack by Don Chen Zhao, Sai reached the pinnacle of his Haoshoken technique, resulting in a kick that was capable of breaking Chen Zhao's proud horn yet again. And rather surprisingly, Chen Zhao's pride in his grandson overcame his grief, and it was only at this point that Sai inherited the title of Don from Chen Zhao, becoming the official leader of the Hapo Navy. So now that we have a grasp on what the Hapo Navy is and what they do, there are still a few things that stick out to me. If Sai wouldn't be developed for another 20 years, then why in the world would he have been chosen as their leader? Was there no ulterior option? Although, like Wano Kuni, it's possible that tradition and honor are important to the country and perhaps played a role in their decision. After all, Chen Zhao did swear to hold a grudge against 
not only Garp for what he did, but also his son, Monkey D. Dragon, as well as all of his descendants. And that kind of hatred is really only possible from a place with some strong pride and beliefs about honor and tradition, for better or for worse. So to get a peek as to what could have happened in the Hapo Navy's past, I think it's best if we look elsewhere in the story, at a similar conflict during a transition of power, the battle between Akainu and Aokiji. When it comes to succession wars, there is no better place in One Piece to look than the battle between Akainu and Aokiji. While the battle itself is largely unimportant to our theory, the motivations and themes behind it are rather key. Although Akainu is the current fleet admiral, it was actually Aokiji who received the nomination for the position from the previous fleet admiral, Sengoku. While Sengoku felt Aokiji was a better fit for the role, Akainu felt otherwise. He felt so strongly that he was the one who deserved the position that he battled Aokiji for it, in a week-long duel that left an island permanently scarred, in the end defeating Aokiji and taking the position for himself. And while many of you know while well, both of these men are from the marines, the two couldn't be any more different, in both their values as a leader to their ideological beliefs. Sengoku noticed this fact and was aware that the promotion of either man would set the organization as a whole on either one of two very different tracks. And that is exactly the situation that I believe Don Chen Zhao found himself in. I believe that Chen Zhao, after his destruction at the Fists of Garp, was forced into choosing between two options. The first being electing his second grandson Sai to become the next Don. Even though he was too underdeveloped, he had the makings of a great man and leader. But doing so would doom the kingdom to over a decade of hardships without the majority of the kingdom's funds. But his other option was even worse. Give the position to Krieg. <laughs> You see, Dong Krieg somehow manages to showcase every negative trait of a military leader, always favoring cruel tactics and his huge arsenal of overwhelming firepower over anything akin to a conversation. He is, and has always been, incapable of any sense of honor, nor can he be sympathetic for anyone. Krieg is characterized only by his cruelty, dishonesty, and arrogance. In fact, Don Krieg's legacy of cruelty began from his earliest known moments in the story, such as his time spent attacking marine ships after flying a white flag, raiding passenger ships while posing as a marine vessel, and even disrespecting the genuine display of respect that both Sanji and Chef Zeph presented to him when they offered him free food to end his dying hunger. Imagine if someone like that were in charge of a pirate navy. Oh, wait. That's right, we do see Dong Krieg acting in his long-awaited position of Dong. In fact, this would perfectly explain every action that Krieg has made in the story thus far. If he, like Arlong, is looking to live out some sort of childhood fantasy by becoming the next Dawn of his own pirate navy and creating his own power and fortune, then maybe Oda has been hinting at this backstory the entire time. I theorize that after his much younger cousin slash brother was selected over him for the position of 13th leader, Krieg abandoned the country of Kano in pursuit of attaining his birthright in one form or another. He set sail for the East Blue, often known for being the weakest of all four seas, and it's there that Krieg was easily able to amass a powerful and loyal army, eventually being worthy of earning his coveted title of Dawn and the Admiral of the Pirate Armada. Once Krieg had amassed the largest fleet in all of the East Blue, he moved his sights to the Grand Line, where he and a fleet of 50 ships set sail with plans to raise havoc over all the Grand Line. Unfortunately for Krieg, on the seventh day of his journey in the Grand Line, he had an encounter with one of the seven warlords of the sea, Dracul Mihawk, and after, no doubt, instigating a fight with him, Krieg's fleet was completely devastated by Mihawk. And after the skirmish, only the flagship of Krieg's once mighty armada survived, though badly damaged. It was at this point that Krieg and his remaining crew fled the Grand Line, risking a trip through the Calm Belt and returning to the East Blue. And Mihawk, in pursuit of Krieg, made a petty ass trip through the Calm Belt in order to finish him off, where he met Zoro at the Baratier and otherwise lost interest in Krieg. It's here that Krieg battles our protagonist, Monkey D. Luffy, over the possession of the Baratier, which, if he succeeds, will act as his new flagship, 
giving him the ability to potentially reform his once great fleet, as well as his last desperate attempt to hold on to his right to the title of Dawn. But after being defeated by Luffy, with his last ship destroyed, Krieg lays on the ground unconscious. Without even a single ship to call his own, Krieg lay stripped of his hard-fought title, and furious at his title of Dawn being taken away from him for the second time in his life, Krieg is consumed by his anger and rises again, fueled only by his rage and injured superiority complex, only to be put down once and for all by his top commander, and forced to retreat. All while the victor of the battle, Monkey D. Luffy, would go on to recruit his younger relative and the next Dawn of the Hapo Navy, eventually inspiring him to gain the ability to crack the Jewel Ice Sheet and reclaim the lost treasure of the Kano Kingdom. After all, unlike Krieg, Sai is honorable and kind, capable of loving his enemy and is a natural-born leader, proving that in the end, Don Chenjiao put the future of the kingdom in the right hands. So please, let me know if you agree or disagree with the theory in the comments below. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. If you made it this far in the video, please leave a like if you enjoyed it, and if you did, you'll probably enjoy some of my other content. So go check out my video about Kuro and his secret backstory being told in the background, or even my new theory about Usopp and his potential upgrades coming in the story. So feel free to subscribe if you would like to see more of me in the future. But that's all for now, and thank you for coming to the Crap Cafe. Uh, yeah.